one of the books I'm writing, I'm actually writing a book with Venkat, but one of the other books I'm writing is with my two granddaughters. And it's going to be called Kid Leaders. So you're the future of the world. The young people sitting here, you are the future. You are the great leaders. You've already shown great exemplary leadership and wonderful success with what you've achieved with this wonderful fundraiser. So let's reflect a little bit on that. Uh, who wants to define success for me? When you hear the word success, what do you think of? Um, I think of uh, achieving your goals. Or, um... Beautiful. Wonderful. Anyone else? Well, I think of it as like accomplish, accomplishing something that you really want to set a okay. goal for us for a long time. All right. Anyone else? The adults are also loved to chime in. Be happy. You're happy doing right? what you're doing. I think. You're happy doing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So if you think of your job, and, and many of the adults have jobs, you all have jobs. Is your job work? Is your work a job? Is it a career? Or is it a calling? Right? Some people go to work 9 to 5 and they're itching to get home. They've had it by the end of the day. Not enjoying their job, their work. Other people, it's a career. They're on a certain trajectory. And they have a goal in mind and they want to achieve that. Right? And for other people, it's actually a calling. It resonates deep down at the level of the heart. They would do it even if it was for a dollar for the year. Raj and I were having this discussion. He has incredible energy and in what he's doing uh, financially, with his family, spiritually, and creating leaders all over. And he, he doesn't get tired. When you do that kind of work, you actually get energized. You can work 16, 18 hours a day as long as you take care of yourself. And one of the things I recommend to everyone is you should meditate. And you should meditate once a day. And if you don't have time to do that, you should meditate twice a day. <laughs> right? So it's one of the most powerful things you can do. So your definition of success is beautiful. That's exactly what it is. Success is a journey. It's not a destination. So one good working definition of success is that success is the progressive realization of a worthy ideal or goal. The moment you pick something worthy to do and start working at it, you're successful. When you achieve that goal, there'll be a moment of bliss and a peak experience, but it's really the journey and what you learned during the journey. So success is a destination. Success is a journey. It's not a destination. Success is the progressive realization of a worthy ideal or goal. And who does it have to be worthy for? Who does it have to be worthy for? Yourself. Yourself, right? If you're doing it to impress your dad or your mom or your sister or a boyfriend, girlfriend, a neighbor, it's not going to work in the long run. It, it really has to tie at the heart. It has to be successful for you. Who was the first person who climbed Mount Everest? He was from New Zealand. He died about a year and a half ago. Edmund Hillary died at age 92. He's a very humble man. That's one of the attributes of great leaders. They have a lot of humility. Albert Schweitzer won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1952. He was a physician, theologian, musician, humanitarian. And when he got the Nobel Peace Prize, he said, now I have to go earn it. Talk about humility. Now I have to go earn it. And Sir Edmund Hillary was knighted. He was from New Zealand, the son of a beekeeper. And uh, he died about two years ago at the age of 92. You could walk into his home, knock on his door, and he'd serve you a cup of tea and tell you stories. So when he was asked, what was the crowning achievement of your life? Being the first person to climb the highest mountain in this world, Mount Everest, 29,072 feet, with the Sherpa Tenzing Norgay from Nepal. He said, no, 
That was not the crowning achievement of my life. All I did was leave a footprint on a mountain. He said, it is not the mountain that we conquer, but ourselves. Right? So if you conquer your fears, your doubts, you've conquered. That's the real victory in life. So when he came back from the summit, he turned to the Sherpas and he said, what can I do for you? And they said, build schools and clinics for the poor people of Nepal. So he started the Everest Foundation, Himalayan Trust. He climbed, he went to the North Pole, the South Pole, but he said the most worthwhile things I have ever done was the building of schools and clinics for the poor people of Nepal. That has given me more satisfaction than a footprint on a mountain. Who was the first person to run the mile under four minutes? It was a physician from England. He was a medical student. And during his lunch break, one hour, he would run, sprint for 52 minutes. His name was Roger Bannister. And then in Oxford at Epley, he ran the track. And prior to that, every exercise physiologist, sports official, physician, scientist had said, it is humanly impossible to run the mile under four minutes. It's not possible. He trained, he ran it. And what happened in the next six months? 22 other people ran it. They said, if Roger Bannister can do it, I can do it. Right? So the mind is a very, very powerful thing. There's a wonderful saying, what the mind of man can conceive and believe, it can achieve. If you can conceive and believe that we can raise $10 million in the next 10 years. It will happen. You have to believe it. First you have to conceive it, then believe it, and then it can be achieved. So Roger Bannister was also asked later in life. He said, was asked, what was the crowning achievement of your life, being the first human being to run a mile under four minutes? He said, no. He became a neurologist, and he contributed in a field called autonomic neuropathy. He developed some tests for that. He said, my contributions to the field of neurology, autonomic neurology, that was my lasting contribution. Right? So when you think of success, one of the most important things is, like you said, to have your goals and then achieve them. So one of the most important things we can do is actually write down our goals. Not only think about them, but actually write them down. And there's a study that was published uh, in a book and, and the title of the book is very neat. It's called, What They Don't Teach You at Harvard Business School. <laughs> Written by a guy from Yale. <laughs> <laughs> and he talks about how 20 <coughs> years ago, this book came out 10, 15 years ago, 20 years prior to that, the graduating class at Yale Business School was asked the question, how many of you have written down your goals? And the answer was 3%. How many of you think of your goals on a frequent basis? The answer was 14%. Right? So 17% either wrote their goals and then an action plan or thought about their goals on a frequent basis. 83% weren't doing that. Now, on Friday, I have to take a flight and go to California. I'm going to give a talk. And it's not even thinkable that the pilot will get up to 35,000 feet and say, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Captain Jennifer Staple. Uh, where should we fly to today? <laughs> they have a very clear idea of what altitude they're flying, which city they're flying to. <coughs> but many of us go through life without really thinking about our goals. So what happened 20 years later? They interviewed these, the graduating class of Yale Business School. And the 17% who had either written their goals or thought about them frequently, in all the subjective parameters, such as feeling happy, fulfilled, having good relationships with their spouses, with their family, were much higher than the other 83%. And also very interestingly, their combined income was greater than the combined income 
of the 83% who had not written their goals. So write down your goals, put an action plan. Now when you write your goals, at, at this young age for you, it will often be you know, goals about your schooling. You want to do excel in your studies, you want to go to a good college, you may have a career in mind. But at the same time, reflect on family goals, social goals, physical goals. And for many of us, as we get older, we think of spiritual goals <laughs> as well. And in order to be successful, you have to have a modicum of success in all of those domains. Right? If you're the richest person in the world, but you don't have a good family life, you don't have friends, you have no social skills, you're not really happy. You may have the biggest bank balance in the world. So I would encourage all of you to think of your goals, write down your goals, and then put an action plan next to them. Now, should your goals be lofty or should they be realistic? What do you think? Huh? Realistic. What do you think? Realistic. 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 Obviously, I don't like the answer. <laughs> right? Now, it's interesting. I've done this exercise with physicians at Harvard Medical School, including <coughs> full professors and tenured professors, and the interns, residents, fellows, junior faculty. And every time I've done it, half the people have said realistic and the other half has said lofty. I said both. You said both. <laughs> Very good. So in reality, they should be lofty. They can't be crazy lofty. There has to be some realistic element to those lofty goals. So Thoreau once said, if you have built castles in the air, your work need not be lost. That is where they should be. Now go put the foundations underneath. If somebody says to you, don't daydream, that's very bad advice. You should be daydreaming. Build castles in the air, but then go put the foundations underneath. Michelangelo once said, the greater tragedy for most of us is not that we aim too high and fall short. We aim too low and reach the mark. Right? So aim high. So I, I'm a golfer, I started playing 18 years ago, and I made a goal, I'm going to be a single digit golfer. And then I took lessons and I practiced a lot, and I was able to achieve that. If I said to myself, I want to hit the ball 350 yards beyond Tiger Woods, that's unrealistic, that's, that's crazy. But you should really have lofty dreams and lofty goals, and then put the action plan next to it, put the foundations underneath. So we talked about Thoreau, Michelangelo. Henry Ford once said, whether you believe you can do a thing or believe you cannot, you're right. You understand that? Whether you believe you can do a thing or believe you cannot, you're right. So if you convince yourself that I want to be the CEO of a company, I will do this non-profit, I will feed a million kids, in Asia, and you actually can conceive it and believe it, write it down, you'll achieve it. It's really amazing, when you write something down, I call it support from nature. Suddenly you'll start meeting people who will be telling you about things. <clears throat> How did that happen? I just wrote down this goal and next week I met this person, and now it's moving along. Right, so success is a journey, make lofty goals, write them down, you're the future, you're the future leaders. There's a story of a young lady by the name of Jennifer Staple. She was a pre-med student at Yale. And she does an ophthalmology rotation during the summer. She's very saddened to see people who've grown blind from preventable, treatable causes of blindness. Guess who these people are? Poor people, right? Never got to see a doctor. Never got to see an eye doctor. They're going too late when they've already incurred blindness. So she comes back, she's 19 years of age, she comes back to Yale and with 29 other pre-med students, forms an organization called Unite for Sight. In the last seven years, they have done 63,000 <coughs> sight restoring surgeries. They have seen 1.3 million patients 
They have trained 7,000 fellows. She has 4,000 volunteers working for her. Dental students, nursing students, medical students, web designers, professors of ophthalmology. She has won many awards. She got admission to Stanford Medical School. She wants to be an ophthalmologist. And she deferred it for two years. She said, I have to work 80 hours a week on my organization. And the Dean of Admissions at Stanford said, Jennifer, when you're ready, we'll be ready for you. Take your time. Amazing young leader, right? 19 years of age, one interaction. I'm reading a book right now. I've shared this with Raj. I've told Venkat about this book. It's called Promise of a Pencil. You should read this book. It's an amazing story. A guy by the name of Adam Braun, he, when he's 16, does uh, an elective rotation internship with a hedge fund. Then he graduates from Brown University. He gets a job at Bain, one of the top firms. He's not happy. That's not what is creating happiness. Albert Schweitzer once said, success is not the key to happiness. Happiness is the key to success. If you're happy, you'll succeed. It's infectious. Your happiness will spread in the firm, in the company. People will want to be with you, help you out. They'll see your vision. They'll recognize your leadership. So he's not happy. So he decides to travel around the world. And every country he goes, he picks a young eight-year-old girl or boy on the street and through an interpreter asks a question. So he's in Africa and he meets this eight-year-old girl. And through the interpreter he says to the girl, if you could have one wish in the world, what would it be? And the young girl says, to dance. He says, no, 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 you didn't get the question. You can wish for anything in the world. Ask again. And the girl says, to dance. That's all she wants to do. So he meets another girl in another country, same question, and she says, for my mother to be healthy, hold my hand and walk me to school. He says, no, you can have any wish in the world. What would you want? And the girl repeats it. So he goes to India, and he's mesmerized by India. He goes to Banaras, he dips in the Gandhi, he swallows the water, he doesn't get, not going to get sick. Loves India. It's a spiritual experience for him. He meets an eight-year-old boy on the street, and he asks a question. You could have one wish in the world, what would you want? And the boy says, a pencil. He says, what? You can have any wish in the world, what would you want? The boy says, a pencil. He sees these kids coming out of school. They're laughing, they're playing, they open their notebook, they're drawing, they're writing, they're sketching. He thinks, you know what, this is my ticket to life. I want a pencil. So as he travels in the other countries, he buys a whole lot of pencils and he keeps doling them out on the street. He comes back to New York, he's haunted by the image of this eight-year-old poor boy in India. All he wanted was a pencil. So he starts a foundation, <coughs> Promise of a Pencil. Buys $25, buys a domain site, Promise of a Pencil, with friends in New York, again using social media, in one or two weeks, does a fundraiser, raises $8,000. And with some friends, then travels around the country in a van, goes to colleges, to dorms, and he makes a pitch. I want to build schools. Sometimes one student appears, sometimes 40. He's 28 years of age now. He has built 150 schools. 150 schools in Latin America, Africa, and Asia. Forbes magazine rated him one of the most influential people under the age of 30 in the world. His grandmother is a Holocaust survivor, Eva Braun. She's five feet three inches tall. She says, Anna, what happened to you? You were working for Bain. What is this pencil thing you're doing? He says, Ma, he calls her Ma. He says, Ma, come sit down with me. I'm going to show you three pictures. First picture, he shows these poor kids playing in, on the street some poor country in Africa. Second picture is a beautiful school. And the third slide is the side wall of the school, and there's a plaque. And it says, this school is dedicated to Ma, Eva Braun. And then the two of them saw. 
young guy found his purpose in life. So it will come to you. You don't. You should be thinking about your purpose in life right now. You should be thinking about life and having fun and and studying and broadening your horizons. At the right time, the focus will come. But the point of these two stories, Jennifer Stable and Adam Braun, is that these are young people, and they're doing amazing leadership. He quit paint. He's more happy. You see his picture on the cover of the book? Bliss, joy, happy. So I want to wish all of you great success in life. You guys inspire people like me and Venkat and the rest of us, the adults, not only your parents, but the rest of us. And uh, you will see so much success. Embrace it, but write down your goals. Also, when you meet with young people, discuss ideas. Eleanor Roosevelt was the first lady, and she once said, small minds discuss people, average minds discuss events, great minds discuss ideas. Now you guys know each other, you've done some teamwork, build on it. You say, you know, I have an idea. We should have a competition between this school and that school, whatever, you, you guys will come up with the best ideas and, and build on the success you've already done. Okay, it's a journey, it's not a destination. You've achieved great success and you should be so proud of yourself. bunch of these quotes, Thoreau and many others. Deepak Jain is a legendary dean, He's an amazing individual. He was the dean of the Kellogg School of Management in Illinois, created one of the top five MBA programs in the world. He's now the dean at INSEAD in Paris, also rated one of the top five MBA programs in the world. And he once said, the challenge ahead of you is never greater than the force behind you. You have the power to move the world. And when, when you encounter a challenge, my one plea to you is, don't use the word problem. In my department at the medical school, if somebody walks into my office and say, we have a problem, I say, please sit down. <laughs> we, have, we have a challenge. Use the word problem, everyone is weighted and negative. You use the word challenge, everybody wants to come up with a solution. You'll encounter a lot of challenges, you'll encounter some adversity, you will grow from it. It's a gift. You were talking earlier, the gift of adversity. It's a wonderful gift. So, but unmitigated success. <laughs>